I'm going to tell you about some of these things we can actually do, do about this problem. Uh, so to begin with, at the moment, most of our energy comes from burning things that we've dug out of the ground, like Kaveh mentioned. Uh, uh, coal, oil, and natural gas are fossil fuels that we burn out of the ground to produce the energy which powers our electronics and heats our homes. That's good. We, we need that energy to do those things. But what we don't need is the carbon dioxide. So to prevent future climate change, instead of burning things that we dig out of the ground, we could just not do that anymore. Uh, since this is a problem that humans have caused by burning things that we've dug out of the ground, we can solve the problem by not doing that. Of course, that's very easy to say, but it's clearly a big challenge. And one way to uh, think about solving a big challenge like this is breaking it up into smaller pieces that, that we can manage one piece at a time. Uh, and two, so two scientists at Princeton University, Robert Sokolow and Stephen Pakala, shown here, uh, uh, came up with a description of how to solve this problem that they called, referred to as decomposing a heroic challenge into a limited set of still monumental tasks. So, so we break this big problem up of not burning more fossil fuels into more limited tasks that we can tackle one at a time. Uh, historically, uh, every year, we've been burning more fossil fuels than the year before, and thus putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than we did the year before. So, so this is a plot showing historical emissions going back to about the time when we started monitoring the atmosphere. And you can see that the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere is, ev is more every year. And we can expect this trend to continue as developing countries use more energy to power their economies, and as our factories build more things. So the first step, then, is to get ourselves on a flat path. So every year, not put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than we did in the previous year, so that at some point in the future, we can start reducing the amount of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere until, at some point even further in the future, we're not putting any more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we've effectively solved the problem of global warming. Now again, that's, e that's easy to say, but this, this triangle here uh, is, is a lot of future carbon dioxide emission that we have to prevent. Uh, so so um, this, this triangle represents that heroic challenge that Pakala and Sokolo talked about. Uh, so what they did was they broke it up into individual wedges. Each wedge that you see here represents a certain amount of future carbon dioxide emission that we have to prevent from occurring over, say, the next 50 years. Each of those wedges is one of those uh, is one of those monumental tasks that Pakala and, so and Sokolo talked about, and they give a number of examples of possible wedges that we can use to prevent future carbon dioxide emission. So we can make up one wedge by building much more efficient buildings and by insulating the buildings that we already have. We can also uh, generate power through clean energy sources like wind or nuclear or solar power that don't burn fossil fuels that we've dug out of the ground and add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Uh, another way that we could, we could prevent a wedge of future carbon dioxide emission is having much more efficient cars. Um, also, if we end tropical deforestation, that's another way to prevent carbon dioxide getting into the atmosphere and also let those trees, as Kabe said, trees absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so if we keep those trees there, they will continue to absorb carbon dioxide. So that's another way to prevent future carbon dioxide emission. Now, one of the best things about Pakala and Sokolo's wedges is that they all involve technology that we currently have. We don't need to invent anything new in order to prevent this future emission. We just have to put out all of the technology that we currently have on a very large scale. Now, none of these individual wedges is perfect. There's no one silver bullet that will solve the problem all by itself. So that's why we need a lot of different options. And these are just some examples. There, there are many others that Pakal and Sokolo and others have described since. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about three example wedges to give you an idea of what these big tasks that we have ahead of us are. The first wedge that I'm going to talk about is wind power. So uh, we can generate electricity by putting up a wind turbine, which is basically a fan on a big tower. And as the wind blows, it turns that turbine. and that. It turns that fan, and as that fan turns, it turns a generator, and that generates electricity. This picture here is an artist's conception of the Cape Wind Wind Farm, which is going to be built in, which is, uh, was recently approved to be constructed in Nantucket Sound. Uh, when it's completed, it will generate 75% of the power for Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and Cape Cod. 
So that, that's a lot of power that this will generate. So we can, we can think about how much wind, new wind power we have to build by using this Cape Wind Farm as an example. So OK, so what do we need to do? Around the world, we're going to have to build 90 Cape Wind Farms worth of new wind power every year. That's a lot of new wind power. But it turns out that just last year, we built effectively that much wind power around the world. So if we can keep building for the next 50 years as, as much wind power as we built last year, we're on track to make one wedge of wind power. That's good news. In fact, this year we're, we're currently uh, around the world, is we're planning to build more wind power than we built last year. So we might even be able to prevent more than one wedge of future carbon dioxide emission just through new clean wind power. That's good news. But as I said, no wedge is perfect. Uh, uh, you, may have, you may have heard that some countries are having to significantly improve their power grids. For example, here in the US, uh, if, for, if the wind is blowing in Vermont and it's not blowing here in Connecticut, we need some way to get the power that they're generating in, Ver in Vermont down here to Connecticut. So we need a better power grid. Uh, as an example, Germany, because they're significantly in increasing the amount of wind power that they're producing, needs to improve their power grid, and that requires a lot of investment. On the other hand, that will produce a lot of jobs, highly skilled jobs, for people to build that new power infrastructure. Uh, another example of a wedge is solar power. Uh, this picture here is the PS10 solar power tower near Sevilla, Spain. And there's a whole field of mirrors that are shining, that are shining light from the sun on the top of this tower, and you can actually see the light here shining into the tower. It's so concentrated, you can see it reflecting off of dust in the air. At the top of that tower, that light that's coming in is heating water, turning it into steam. That steam then runs a, runs a turbine, uh, uh, just like when we, when we heat water into steam with coal power or natural gas. Here, we, here we're just doing it just with energy from the sun, and that turbine generates electricity. So we can generate clean power just by using the energy that we get from the sun, that, as Kawai said, is, is shining on us. And we can use this solar platform in Spain as another example of how much new solar power we need to generate every year in order to create a wedge of solar. So, so what do we need? So every year, for the next 50 years around the world, we need to build 110 new solar platforms worth of solar power. Once again, that's quite a lot. How are we doing? Well, just last year, we built about 75 of these solar platforms worth of solar power. So we're not quite there yet. We're not yet on track to prevent a, a wedge of uh, future carbon dioxide emission just from solar power. We need to build more solar power around the world in order to do that. On the other hand, some countries are doing pretty well. Uh, just recently, Germany was in the news as setting a new solar power record. Uh, uh, Germany, the last Saturday in May, produced 50% of their power for their entire country only from solar power. So, so half the power for the entire country on one day just came from the sun. So, so, so some countries are, are well on their way to producing most of their power from clean sources like this. Now, as an example of a different kind of wedge, instead of building new power sources, we can just use the power that we have more efficiently. This picture here is a building some of you may have seen. This is, the, this is Kroon Hall, the Yale School of Forestry. This is a new building. It's a LEED Platinum building. The LEED standards are building design and efficiency standards. It's, as you can see, there are, there are solar panels on the roof. And these, actually, these, these dark spots here are solar water heaters that they use to generate hot water. It's a very inexpensive building to heat and cool because it's very well insulated. And it, it also uses very efficient lighting. So if we build our new buildings to very efficient standards like this, we'll be able to prevent future carbon dioxide emission by just using our power more intelligently. Uh, and that brings me to the difference between most of the wedges that I've been talking about. For example, new power sources. Uh, and, and one of these wedges, more efficient buildings, are actually uh, something that individuals have some control over. Uh, adding new power sources are, requires big policy changes. Uh, so this brings me to the last thing I want to talk about, which is what individuals can do to help with this. Uh, so the, the first thing you can do is you can insulate your home. This is a picture of the heat leaking out of a house, just like Kabe showed a picture of the heat leaking out of the earth. And you can see heat's leaking out of windows and along the roof line. 
and that if this house were, were uh, more, better insulated and have, had more efficient windows, less heat would leak out, and the people living there would have to burn less gas in order to heat the house. Uh, now, of course, if you're going to insulate your house, you want to get the best bang for your buck, right? You want, you want to insulate it in the way that costs you the least money and gets you the biggest imp possible improvement. Uh, so the one way to do that here in Connecticut, uh, the, the New Haven Office of Sustainability has a program called the Green and Healthy Homes Program. And you can sign up on their website. There's a link on your handout. And there are also, uh, on, the, on the table in the back, there's also um, information from this program. Uh, you can go on their website and sign up for their program, and people will come up and, and do a, f a free energy audit of your house. And they'll go and they'll look for places where heat is leaking out, and they'll check on, how, on your furnace. Uh, and if, you can also do this if you're a renter. I rent. Uh, I had them come out and do this, and they patched some, pa patched some cracks around my window uh, and did some other things. And they gave me a packet of information that I took to my landlord, and I said, could you put new insulation in our house with these coupons in this packet? And so my landlord went and blew new insulation into the house, and he got 50% off blowing new insulation in. And our gas bill was half as much the subsequent year because there was more insulation in the house, so we didn't have to burn as much gas. So that was really great. It was good for us as renters because our gas bill was lower, and it was good for our landlord because the value of the house went up because he put insulation in, and it was cheap for him to do so. Uh, now, now, this brings me to my last point, which is that individual actions like, like insulating your house, and I, I'd lo love it if everyone here went to that website, picked up that information here, went to that website, and signed up for a home energy audit if you haven't already done it. Those are great things to do, but we also need policy changes and political changes. We need political will in order to build more clean energy sources and have a, a more efficient power grid. Uh, so, so political will is something that you can all uh, help develop by talking to your, your congressmen and your congresswomen uh, and your senators about how important uh, preventing future climate change is. Um, but there are also organizations and movements working uh, towards this end on both a global and a local scale. And one of the best ones is 350.org. The name 350.org comes from the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that scientists consider to be safe. Uh, 350.org works both globally, lobbying governments in the US and China and Europe, to have better uh, climate policy and more clean energy. Uh, they also work locally. There's a Connecticut chapter here in Connecticut that's presently working to close the last remaining coal power plant in Connecticut. We have one coal power plant left in Connecticut, and we don't actually need it anymore. We have enough power from other sources that we can close that plant. And so they're, they're working with uh, the Connecticut state government to get that plant closed. Uh, so, so I hope I've convinced you that we can do it. We have the technology now, and I've given you some examples. Uh, we, can, we can generate energy from clean sources. We can use our, the energy that we have more efficiently to prevent future carbon dioxide emission, to reduce the effects of global warming, and eventually stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so that we'll have a stable climate. Um, uh, this won't be easy, but a stable climate is within our reach. Um, and so, so just to wrap this all up, uh, today Kave has talked to you about uh, how we know that greenhouse gases warm our atmosphere. Allison has told you about some of the effects that a warmer, more carbon dioxide rich atmosphere will have on plants, animals, and us. Uh, and I hope I've convinced you that we really have the power right now to do something about that uh, through both uh, large, large actions like building more efficient power and, and through individual actions like insulating your home. Uh, and and this, we, this is a difficult task that we have ahead of us, but we really, need, we really need to take this on and do it because of what's at stake.